Our next guest has made a big splash in the debate surrounding free speech issues on college campuses, something, an issue near and dear to my heart. Uh, she wrote this New York Times op-ed titled, I came to college eager to debate, I found self-censorship instead. Emma Camp writes, quote, I went to college to learn from my professors and peers. I welcomed an environment that champions intellectual diversity and rigorous disagreement. Instead, my college experience has been defined by strict ideological conformity. Students of all political persuasions hold back from saying what we really think. Emma is a senior at the University of Virginia. She joins us now to discuss her piece. Emma, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. So you've received some backlash on this, which is kind of interesting because it sort of I guess so showcases your entire point um, about not being able to say and, and think the way you want. Now, colleges have always been thought to be the places where these radical ideas could be born and discussed and debated, but that's not the experience you had. Yes, that's true. So I, I think a lot of what's been going on is you know, I, I really think that in an ideal world, the purpose of a college education is to kind of grow and develop intellectually. But I think what's happening is that right now there's a lot of kind of social capital to be gained from kind of publicly dunking on other people. Um, and so what that really incentivizes is this like really harsh social backlash for kind of the expression of any political opinion that goes outside of the acceptable mean. And I think what happens is that a lot of college students are constantly terrified of saying the wrong thing. And of course, when you're terrified of saying the wrong thing, you're inherently terrified of thinking the wrong thing. And so I think what happens is a lot of people close themselves off to that kind of intellectual development that I think is so important. Yeah, my in my research on this subject, I've, writ I've written a lot about it. And, and, and by the way, you're, you're coming to work with us at Reason, which I'm very ex excited about. This is a funny way to meet for the first time. I, I see this, uh, this op-ed going viral the other day. I'm like, oh, who, this is really good. Who wrote it? And like, oh, they're coming to work for us. Great. Um, and anyway, my diagnosis of the problem, it, it seems like it's not, it's different, slightly different from campus to campus, but often it is not uh, most of the teachers or even most of the students who, it's not that they want you to self-censor, but there's a minority of students who are very militant, uh, kind of against the concept of free speech because they're worried that, they're, they're very worried that offended feelings are like a form of violence. So if anyone is upset, you've, you've allowed violence to happen against them. And, and it's those people, again, not most people on campus, but a smaller number, who successfully shut down all discussions uh, on those grounds. Is something like that been your experience? Yeah, I think I would agree with that largely. I, I definitely think a lot of this phenomenon happens because students don't want to be you know, the subject of the day in terms of who, who has the ire from the minority of students focused on them. So I would agree with that prognosis. Uh, Fairly yeah, so. and, and, I, and then ironically, you, so you point that out, and then you were very much the student of the day, <laughs> at least on, on Twitter. When you, I saw all these, it was Kim, as you mentioned, all these very, you know, massive accounts tend to be people in the sign of mainstream or left of center or liberal media uh, with massive followings, people with big platforms um, doing the thing that I've often heard them say you're not supposed to do, with like punching down, right? Aren't you not supposed to just viciously attack or make fun of or belittle or bully? Uh, you know, people uh, like in your position who are at the start of their uh, promising careers, and yeah, that's exactly what they were doing. Yeah, I, I found the the response to my article very much sort of proving the point I have to make, which is that you know individuals who step a toe out of line face this really intense and really disproportionate social social backlash, and then. I said that in public, and then the name Emma was trending on Twitter. Wow. Um, so it, it, was, it was certainly um, a, a crash course in writing publicly. Um, and I do get a little bit of satisfaction in knowing that this response sort of proves that I have a point. And Emma, I thought the, the pile on was un unfair and untoward, and, and that it, it, in some ways it did prove your point. But I also want to press you on on part of it, isn't, isn't there a way in which you're doing some of the same thing that you're accusing your critics of by, and, and tell me if this is a fair headline. The headline says, you know, I came to college looking for debate. You know, if it, there's, this, there's this elevation of the idea of debate, which I actually find in conflict with, with dialogue and with learning how to think. 
Like as you're moving from high school into college and then from college on, you're really developing what you think about the world. But if you come into the conversation already convinced of what you think of the world and just looking for people to debate you, like there's something about the debate me bro culture that <laughs> is the antithesis to me of intellectual development. And so to have to find that people are annoyed by that to me doesn't necessarily prove the point. Like when I was in college, there was often always that one student who just wanted to like get in arguments for the sake of arguments rather than kind of sorting through ideas. And I, I, whenever that, whoever that person was would raise their hand and be like, oh God, here we go. We're just gonna now, we're just gonna be just kind of scoring points against each other for the rest of this class. I mean, the first thing I'd say to that is I don't write my headlines, right? I, I, <laughs> I write. Yeah. The That's why I asked you if you thought it was article. fair. Yeah. I, I really didn't, when, when I sat down to write it, I didn't really think of it as about debate per se, but about just being able to express a wealth of ideas and possibly have productive conversations about them or even be able to entertain them. So I, I understand the frustration you exp uh, express there, but I, I really didn't intend to communicate that idea at all. And you know, it, it's part of the perils of not writing your own headlines, I suppose. And sometimes debate's not necessarily just to score points, but I like that phrase, the debate me bro culture. I've never <laughs> heard that one before, but you know, a lot of times it's about, you know, the debate is about learning and growing from one another. And one thing that I think Ryan and I would both appreciate about your piece, Emma, is that you mentioned that you sort of sought refuge in the philosophy department. I know Ryan and I both have our degrees in philosophy, so we, we get it, you know, we go to those departments and study that uh, in order to have those various different points of view brought up and, and to discuss. And oftentimes, you know, when you are studying philosophy, we're forced to take a position. And then the very mm -hmm. next class, they say, now that you've taken this position on this, you need to take the other position and debate that just as ferociously as you did the very first. But that's, so that's interesting. So where did you find places in college, you know, for other students that are watching this and they're wondering and they're feeling stifled, where can they go that you found in college where they can have these sorts of intellectual, conversations that, I guess, challenge the norms? Really the main place where I find that is a, it, it's, I, it's technically a debating society, but it isn't a debating society in the way we would think of it, where it's a lot of debates. I mean, it's sort of like a, a social intellectual club at UVA called the Jefferson Society. Um, it's where I have most of my friends and it's where, it's really the only place at UVA I've been able to find where there's these kind of cross ideological friendships. I really don't know anyone outside of the Jefferson Society who has cross ideological friendships. So some of my best friends, like one of my best friends is in abject Marxist Leninist. He is a communist and we argue about communism all the time because I'm a left libertarian, but we're still able to be really good friends, right? And I also have friends who are way more conservative than me or way more leftist than me. And we're able to not really have debates. I don't really think of us as debating each other, but have like good, good faith conversations about political topics and also about things that are completely unrelated and just about our lives or a movie we liked. Um, and so that's really where I, I found at UVA where I can have this kind of rich conversations. And it's one of my favorite things about my college experience. Yeah, and where, where were you when you kind of learned that the piece had been published and that you were trending? And what, what was that? What was that like? So I was actually in a cabin in the mountains of Virginia. I had gone on a very brief kind of two day spring break trip with some friends and the cabin had really spotty Wi-Fi. So I knew it was going to be published on Monday morning and I could I was I could hear my phone starting to blow up. And I looked at my Twitter because I, I figured that it would have some kind of response. And I checked Twitter and it was, there were a lot of responses, but thankfully I had friends who were saying, Emma, put your phone down, play Frisbee, Emma, put your phone down, <laughs> let's, let's play cards. And so it wasn't until later when one of my friends goes, Nicole Hannah-Jones just did a thread about you. I was like, what? And then my friends went, Emma, you're trending on Twitter. And I was like, what? And so I, it was really this kind of shocking response because frankly, I knew something like this was a possibility, but to be honest, thinking, it, it felt kind of like a self-centered thought to think, I am a camp and so important <laughs> to break the internet. Like I actively tried to keep myself from having that thought because it felt like vanity. So what ended up happening is that I was very shocked by the degree of attention that the piece got. That must be something because for you to even ask that question. That's like, a silly, that to me seemed like a funny question to ask but because it's like, what do you mean? Where were you when you went viral? <laughs> like, is this something that people 
remember, where were you when you first went viral? Do you remember? I've never gone viral. I'm sure. Oh, no. come on, right? Oh, that's oh, not give me a break. Where were you when you went viral? Where were you when you went? I, viral? I can remember like sitting in my before I moved to DC, sitting in my house that I, uh, my wife and I lived in briefly before we moved to DC. Uh, when the UVA, uh, uh, UVA, the the Rolling Stone rape scandal story yeah. that I was like uh, one of the first early skeptics of, and then everyone online was calling me like a denier of rape for 24 hours. Where were you? So I was like, it was in my living room. So then I, was in my, I was pacing. I was in my family room, living room, bedroom, just back. We're like, is this the end? And then the whole story got to Biden. Well, it's funny because you asked this question. I'm thinking, who would know where they were? But then when I recently went viral on Kim Twitter, goes viral like three times <laughs> a day. No, I mean, so, was, yeah, you don't remember. Well, this was a time when, that, when people were hating on me. And Keith Olbermann came after me. And there were all these people that were coming after me. Oh. And um, I was actually at Disneyland when that happened. And I, I remember now sitting in right, yeah. at the restaurant at Disneyland at the happiest place on earth, finding out that I was being dragged on Twitter. So it's like funny. It can be a searing experience. And uh, Emma, I'm curious if there was anything that people said publicly that you agreed with that made you think like, huh, okay, that's actually a fair point. Yeah, I, I think one of the main things that I definitely think is fair is people who kind of pointed out my immaturity. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I definitely got a lot of responses that were kind of like, ah, I agree with the point, but this isn't a very good example of the genre. And to that, I sort of say they're probably right. You know, I, I recognize that I'm very young and that I'm a very early point in my career. And I really hope that when I'm the same age as a lot of my good faith critics when I'm 32 or 42 or older, you know, my writing is much more developed and much more strong. So I, I certainly take those points, uh, especially. And you and you got a, a, and we'll let you go, but I, I, some people were being like, oh, how dare someone have this opinion, like, during a war with Ukraine, aren't there more important things going on? But like, you didn't choose when this op-ed gets published, right? Did it, you probably wrote no, this weeks ago? I no, I didn't. I, I really find the the funniest thing about them when people are going, "Why are we talking about this when there's a war in Ukraine?" And I went, "Yeah, why are we talking about this when there's a war in Ukraine? You don't have to pay this much attention to me, please." Do something else. <laughs> About, good point. Well, Emma, thank you so much uh, for joining us. It was nice to meet you and look forward to meeting you in person when you come down to D.C. All right. Thank you so much. And coming up, the NIH sent The Intercept 300 plus pages of redacted documents in response uh, to our uh, part of our legal battle that we have ongoing with them. We'll go over that next.